Hello and welcome to the Max Amperes Radio. My name is Jan Frisse and today I have the huge honor to have Dr. Eric Helms on this podcast. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know him and um, yeah, hello and welcome Eric. Well, thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, just, um, just real quick, you have been a huge inspiration for myself and I know for quite a few people. And I just wanted to get that out of the way. And uh, yeah, just um, thank you again for doing this. I hugely appreciate it. And um, yeah. I'm honored to hear that. And I'm happy to be here. It's, it's always good to be able to talk to people about stuff I like. So it's all good. Yeah, the stuff we love. That's right. Um, uh, just in case somebody actually doesn't know you, um, I will give you the quick opportunity to uh, introduce yourself and maybe tell people what you do and yeah. For sure, yeah. So I am basically just someone who fell in love with lifting uh, in every facet. So both the experience, the community, uh, the results, uh, the process, the journey, and as well as the, the science behind it. Um, began competing in uh, natural bodybuilding and powerlifting in 2006, 2007. Uh, became a personal trainer the year prior to that. Um, and have just tried to take it as far as I can. Um, in 2009, I formed 3D Muscle Journey, uh, which is a uh, basically an online coaching service where we also try to create a community and provide evidence-based information to natural bodybuilders with my colleagues Jeff Alberts, Alberto Nunez, Brad Limas, and Andrea Valdez. Um, and been studying this stuff, uh, both nutrition and training, uh, for long time now. Just recently finished my PhD uh, last year in strength and conditioning and previously to that I did a master's in sports nutrition and a master's in exercise science. Uh, so yeah, I'm just uh, like lifting things up that are heavy, putting them back down and then learning about the best way to do that. So Excellent description actually. Thank you. Um, today's topics will be um, training in a contest prep and um, how your um, views may differ um, in the in the last few years. Um, injury risk variables and maybe we will touch on a topic that was recently discussed in mass but I'm not quite sure if we will made it um, time wise so I would just start with the um, training in a contest prep or a really like prolonged diet and mm -hmm. um, I would just ask you like what um, would you differ um, when it comes to training in a contest prep or just like really prolonged diet and how your, uh, your views may have changed in some um, yeah, topics or some variables? Sure. Yeah, so I think um, overall, fundamentally, things shouldn't change that much whether you're in the, uh, the off-season or in a calorie surplus or maintenance or whether you're actually dieting for a show. Um, the... The fundamental things that will help you maintain muscle are the same ones that help you gain muscle. In fact, it works the same way either way. Um, and you're just trying to, to drive muscle protein synthesis as high as it can, as, as often as it can progressively uh, so that you do indeed gain muscle. Uh, however, you're also going to be losing some muscle in, in, in a state of contest prep. Um, and we've actually learned a little more how a deficit uh, drives muscle loss. Um, and we know that in people who are not very lean, uh, NPS is simply muscle protein synthesis is, is dampened. So the response to training just doesn't quite go as high. However, in lean individuals, you also see an uptick in muscle protein breakdown. So you're kind of getting it from both ends when you are leaner and leaner, um, which is why you typically see more muscle loss towards the end of a diet. So nonetheless, um, you want to try to get NPS as high as you can uh, from effective training. Uh, and to do that, you have to be recovered. So it's not only about providing an effective stimulus, but recovery from that. Uh, and this is where it gets a little more complex because your recovery is going to be hampered uh, when you don't have enough food to, to, you know, to effectively recover, which is just the state of being in contest prep. Um, so for the most part, what I do um, is I, I act mostly reactive instead of proactively to reduce volume, yeah. um, to take more... Uh, deloads and to utilize elements of autoregulation. Uh, so RPE, for example, to allow the person to be more flexible with their load, 
uh, flexible training templates so they can decide when an off day needs to come or when their hardest day is. Um, and just have to keep a close eye on things, uh, especially uh, the, the higher risk, higher stress movements, things like squats, deadlifts, uh, and other compound lower body movements. Those are ones where I will more likely reduce volume at a certain point uh, just because they tend to disproportionately beat you up. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's the overall kind of, of, of approach that I would take a little differently during, during prep. It's just you have to be ready to do more to manage fatigue. Now, the, the way my views have changed, I would say if you were to go back five, six years ago or so, uh, there was a time when we were, we were thinking, you know, hey, uh, you don't have the, the calories or the, um, the, the recovery capacities to do a lot of volume, uh, and tension is, is still the, the driving important factor for, for hypertrophy, so it probably makes more sense just to keep heavy loads, drop your volume initially, and uh, just try to focus on maintaining strength. Um, but now, as we know more about the role of volume, um, and how important it is for hypertrophy. I think that doesn't quite make as much sense. Uh, and obviously, you yeah. won't be able to maintain all of your volume. Uh, but at the same time, you probably shouldn't just drop it out of the gates or you're probably going to exacerbate muscle loss. Uh, so you want to definitely think about fatigue management more carefully. Uh, there may, may be a time where you indeed need to drop volume, um, but you need to do more things to adjust load as needed. Uh, uh, hypertrophy is more about volume and effort. Um, not necessarily just the strict load on the bar. Granted, if you're seeing your loads go down everywhere in contest prep on all movements, that's probably not a good thing, and it probably means you're not managing fatigue very well. Uh, but that, that's why I'm a little more reactive in terms of adjustments to training these days than, than proactive, because I think um, you know, if you were just to start prep and you've got 24 weeks to diet and you just drop your volume by one-third right out of the gates, you probably <clears throat> don't need to do that. You know, initially in prep, when the deficit's not beating you up too bad because your body fat's still high, most people start to feel better. You know, mm -hmm. they they're getting a better cardiovascular shape. Yeah. They're a little more focused on their nutrition. They're they're mentally uh, excited. Um, you know, they're 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 probably getting more focused on sleep and all these other variables. So for like a couple months, you know, on a deficit, you feel better if anything. Um, and that's not until you get a little deeper into prep do you really start to suffer in training. Interesting. Um, I re recently um, read Bertel's article about it that um, I think it was something called a uh, case for higher reps in a prep or something. Yep, and, exactly. Um, yeah, it's kind of, um, we heard a lot from uh, different people in the industry that you can uh, drop your volume, no, not your, yeah, your volume and your frequency by two thirds. Um, which was based on some um, studies where um, they that they did in uh, like isocaloric states, and um, I think um, with the more recent um, research from um, Schoenfeld, we know that probably you can um, keep your volume and maybe drop intensity a little bit. And um, I'm I'm definitely super um, interested in that you actually changed your views in that as well. Yeah, I mean, there, there definitely is research showing in mostly untrained subjects for the most part yeah. uh, that you can drop volume by, I think, two-thirds and maintain load and you will see maintenance of strength, maybe a slight redu reduction in hypertrophy, but not much. Um, there is a bit of research in this area that's a little bit not all exactly pointing in the same direction. Um, but do that. that's, like you said, it's A, that's isochloric research. Yeah. Uh, B, it's probably eight weeks long, if I, re if I recall correctly. Uh, and see they're untrained. So how much that applies to a you know high-level bodybuilder dieting? Probably not very much. Um, and yeah, Berto wrote a great article, which is a um, you know he was one of the first people who was like you know if you maintain kind of your your loads more or less, then you should be all right. Uh, and I think if you see your loads maintained during prep, that's a good sign. But it, that's that's more of the effect versus the cost, you know. And I think yeah. it's. If you can observe your performance to maintain, you're doing something right, or you're doing enough right to to maintain a, a fair chunk of your your muscle mass. Um, but the strategy shouldn't be I'm only going to maintain loads. That's more of a side effect of of at doing adequate volume and training and effort uh, to to maintain your muscle mass. So yeah, that's definitely um, something that as more research has emerged, we've shifted our our position on as, as one should. Cool. 
um yeah we're probably pretty sure at this point that you definitely or that you um have to do less volume to maintain your adaptation than to actually get new ad adaptations so um i think it's just a practicality pr practicality um practicality yeah. practicality to uh, just reduce your loads a little bit and um like lowering your volume through that way than uh keeping intensity and doing a set less or something yeah and i think when you think about it this way if we we know that the vehicle by which resistance training helps us maintain muscle mass in a deficit is that it is driving muscle protein synthesis up. Driving muscle protein synthesis up comes through overload, right? Yeah. So if you were to just go in the gym and do the bare minimum to maintain, that would result in net muscle loss because we're getting a higher level of a breakdown and muscle protein synthesis is going to be capped anyway because we're in a deficit. So the logic of, well, I'm not going to be able to gain anyway, so I might as well go in the gym and just maintain, is actually flawed because the amount to do to maintain is now higher yeah. uh, that you have to do because muscle protein synthesis is blunted and breakdown is greater. So you do have to train uh, with overload in mind and to try to gain muscle. You just won't succeed, but uh, the, the closest to success you can get uh, is maintaining it. And that's not to say that there won't be times where you do gain muscle. In fact, Early on in the prep, you might put on some, and then later in the prep, you might lose it. Uh, but the net effect in almost every study we've seen is, is at best the maintenance of muscle mass um, net over an entire diet, um, which, which is fantastic. And I think losing a little bit is also totally normal. Uh, and even when you, when you do everything right, depending on your individual genetics, training age, et cetera, uh, how you diet, um, losing 10, 20% of, of, of your lost weight as muscle is not bad at all. So. Um, just to clear, just to clear, um, I wasn't saying that you should, um, drop to your maintenance, uh, volumes, um, wide array, but more so just, I mean, in the start, as you said, we are probably not changing as much and we sh should just try to, um, keep everything. And then at some point we have to reduce volume in some kind of way. Exactly. Yep. Cool. Um, I will just um, maybe transition to the next questions um, because it's kind of related to that one. It just fits in pretty well. Um, it's um, I know you have recently, um, I, I don't know if it was on a podcast, but you have sa um, said something like uh, with every bit of more volume that you do, you will um, increase your injury risk. Yeah, I believe so, there's a podcast where, where I said, you know, every, every unit of volume is a unit of risk. You know, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have talked with um, um, Dr. Mike Isotrell about this, and um, I think he also touched on that with uh, Steve Hall on his podcast. Um, and he was, um, they were discussing the um, the uh, difference between doing more volume versus doing more intensity, and also uh, getting more close to failure, um, and mm. how that um, like. Um, relates to um, a higher injury risk, and I just want to um, ask about your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, in theory, I would think that the higher the intensity of a unit of volume, also the higher the risk, you know, so that, that intensity, volume, uh, and so absolute load and also distance to failure yeah. would all be <clears throat> independently uh, and collectively injury risks. That said, I believe, if I recall correctly, um, Greg Knuckles did a, uh, not a peer-reviewed one and not like he tracked these individuals, but he ran a survey on powerlifters, and I don't think he found strong relationships uh, between a lot of these variables and, and injury. Interesting. Um, but that's, like I said, you know, all respect to Greg, but it, it's not necessarily the highest quality evidence in the world. So, I mean... Um, Logically, it would make a lot of sense that the more you do, the more times you set foot in the gym, the more times you are, you are risking injury. Likewise, uh, the heavier the weight you expose your body to, um, you know, the, the, the more potential for injury as well. I mean, getting out of position with 600 pounds is probably more, more potentially injurious than getting out of position with 30 pounds. Um, so I think... I think, yeah, that, that, that just kind of comes with the territory, that, that intensity and volume. Uh, the more you do to overload, the more risk there is. But at the same time, uh, we are still talking about very small risks. 
um, when you look at um, peer-reviewed data on rates of injury, um, bodybuilding is a little bit less than, than most sports. Okay. Uh, and then powerlifting and strongman are higher than bodybuilding, but more similar to other sports. So it's, it's not like it's any more dangerous than, than playing a team sport for the most part. And bodybuilding might even be uh, safer just because you don't have to use heavy loads. You don't have to use specific mm-hmm. movements. You're not actually training for a 1RM. Uh, so I, I would say through the data that we have on injury rates in bodybuilders and powerlifters, it's safe to say that powerlifting training is probably a little more, but not startlingly more, um, risky as far as uh, getting an injury than, than bodybuilding. Um, kind of related to the topic, um, just first of really interesting thoughts and um, just um, kind of related um, a question. Actually, do you change or do you proactively change exercises in a prep at some point just of let's say poor leverages um, because you lose a lot of fat and yeah spots that potentially reduce your um, leverages for a squat for example so when you say leverages change uh, in a way that, that makes you worse at a squat where, how specifically do you see that happening because I hear people say that a lot but I, I don't I know that you like your body changes and it feels different but I specifically speaking of leverages I don't know that I would be confident to say that fat loss changes your levers. Okay. I think for the most part, that's going to be your, you know, your, your segment lengths. Yeah, you probably, for a bench press, for example, you have just more range of motion because you lose fat at the, at the back and at the chest. And for a squat, I could, um, um, I, I could think about that as well, that if you lose fat at your legs, or maybe even um, some lean mass that you just have more range of motion and through your, uh, and that, that kind of changes your, um, not your atomic, uh, an, an, anatomy, but your, anatomy. Um, yeah. but your um, technique will differ from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, in the squat and the deadlift, it feels different, that's for sure, when you lose a lot of weight. Um, if you have a different body, you weigh less. Uh, getting into position might be a little easier, or it might be too easy. You know, you can you can sink in, into depth um, uh, too deep, you know, or deeper than you're you're previously used to. Um, for the bench press, yeah, definitely. I, I think as you lose uh, glute mass, be it fat or or muscle, that you know reduces the decline that you're at, and then as you use, lose chest fat, that's going to increase the range of motion. But I, yeah, I wouldn't say that the, the levers necessarily change um, in the squat and the deadlift. They do in the bench, um, okay. mainly because of the angle. But yeah, I mean, yeah, as, as you diet, I, I think we have a fair amount of data suggesting that a calorie deficit uh, can increase injury risk. Like if you look at the female athlete triad data, um, typically uh, women who are exhibiting disordered eating, um, that is a predictor of injury. Um, which is, you know, typically expressed as, as less total calories, less protein, and a lot of other uh, elements of minor malnutrition. Um, so, yeah, and as I said previously, yeah, like if I have a bodybuilder who we need to reduce volume on, and they're feeling beat up in their legs, typically I'll preferentially reduce it from compound lifts uh, that are a little, a little higher risk during prep, because I think that that makes more sense as far as reducing overall injury risk, and, and you can replace it with another movement. Uh, or if you just actually do want to make it cut, you can just cut it and leave it there. So I think it just depends on the situation. Okay, cool. Um, I would then transition over the um, macro cycle setup for a contest prep. Um, I'm just assuming a contest prep is a macro cycle for a bodybuilder. Um, sure. How would you set up, um, would you even conclude like more strength work in there? Well, how would you set up in, in general a macro cycle for contest prep or a prolonged diet? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the times with, with bodybuilders, I'm operating in just successive meso cycles. So I don't necessarily have an overall, overall plan. Um, you know, when I teach in the SBS Academy, I basically recommend that every like third of the diet, you can drop your volume by about 10% as, as mm-hmm. a decent guideline. Um, and I think that's, that's a useful guideline to have in your head as a coach. But at the same time, I do think it should be more reactive than that. 
So I typically operate in eight to 12 week mesocycles that I then modify based on the previous uh, period with, with the heavy amount of auto regulation in there. Um, so, you know, we're normally training uh, each muscle group two to three times per week um, with at least 10 sets per, per muscle group spread out uh, across those days. Uh, and that level of volume will be also based on where they've been, uh, how much they had in the off season, uh, individual variability on what they seem to respond well to, their training age, a ton of other things, et cetera. Um, and then we'll have a mixture of loading zones. So we'll have some heavy work um, that would be more in the strength zone, um, maybe about a third of their training. Uh, and then the rest will be primarily in that 6 to 20 rep range. Um, and that could be spread out over, you know, three to six days per week, depending on how they like to train. So that, if it was three days per week, that would probably be like upper, lower, full or full, full, full. Uh, if it was six days per week, that would probably be, you know, like legs, push, pull, legs, push, pull off. Um, and just having less volume per session, uh, the, the more, more days per week they train. So it just depends on their schedule, their personal preferences, um, how they like to train, how much carry over they have a fatigue from from compound movements to to uh, other exercises etc uh, and then within those mesocycles I typically set it up so there's a bit of linearity so you'll see repetitions dropping as load goes up um, and there will be a undulating uh, element of it over the week so you'll be doing different repetitions on different days so for example uh, we might have a day let's say we had a basic upper lower split um, day one on upper body let's say we're just going to do bench on both days, might be 3 by 12 and then the day 3 on the upper, second upper body session might be 3 by 5 uh, and then that would undulate within the week, 5 and 12, and the next week it would be linear, so it would go down to uh, 3 by 10 and 3 by 4, the next week might be 3 by 8 and 3 by 3, and then uh, we can deload if we need to or skip the deload depending on how they're feeling. I typically more often to include a fourth week deload while dieting just because it's kind of better safe than sorry, uh, and then restart that cycle slightly heavier if they can do it, uh, of course, using RPE. So if they can't, um, you know, we'll, we'll maintain load or even drop it slightly as needed, depending on uh, just how they're doing. So that, that's a kind of a basic structure. So it would be undulating within the, within the week, um, linear within the mesocycle, and then kind of meeting those big picture criteria of uh, training variables of two to three times per week um, with rep range is anywhere in the 3 to 20, with most of it in the 6 to 20. Uh, RPE is typically going to be between 6 and 10, uh, with the stuff in the 9 to 10 range reserved for like your isolation movements that don't incur a lot of fatigue when you're near failure. And then the uh, 6 to 8 range, uh, or 6 to 9 range even, for the compounds of different phases. Sounds kind of familiar. That's right, yeah. So you may have seen that in the SBS Academy. Yeah, I have. <laughs> um, it's been a while now, but... I remember those days. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so you at some point said that your cycles will be 8 to 10 weeks and then you um, concluded as a, that um, that you deload every 4 weeks. So just want to clarify that. Not always, but but that, that's, that's a decent recommendation. I mean, <clears throat> so in the off-season, for example, I'll often run kind of that 3-week cycle of, yeah. uh, of, of progression. So let's say we go 12, 3 by 12, 3 by 10, 3 by 8. And then if we're feeling great in the off season, we'll go back to three by 12 and increase it, you know, so it might be a deload every seventh week. Um, um, or like if I'm actively coaching someone, it can be auto-regulated, you know, that could be two to three cycles go by without it. Or if they're feeling beat up every, cons every consistently, every, every fourth week, maybe we need to re reorganize our training. Um, so it depends on, on the individual and, um, and, and the situation they're in during prep. I tend to err on the side of taking more deloads and doing more to manage fatigue. Um, so I often recommend to deload every fourth week, but if I'm coaching someone, it doesn't necessarily have to be set up that way. It could be every sixth week or, or we can, we can skip one if they're feeling great, but I, I typically don't see, um, the need to, to, to skip deloads cause I feel okay during prep. It's like, well, you don't know what's going to happen around the corner. You know, um, let's, let's be more conservative as we're dieting and, and getting pretty damn lean. Um, I can uh, anecdotally say that um, deloading in a diet is a really good idea. Absolutely. Um, I know yep. that some people argue that you shouldn't really deload because you aren't really overreaching because it doesn't really make 
progress but and, and um, as you said in the beginning you're actually trying to make progress at least in the beginning and you can actually make progress and even gain some muscle that you then eventually lose later but um, yeah yeah and I would just say to those people who go well if you're not making progress you're not overloading that they don't really understand the stress recovery cycle like uh, overreaching and overloading is that's focusing on just the training side of it and assuming that if you do enough training you will get a, a result but you also have to recover from that training and that that's that's the huge issue during dieting so you can pump a bunch of volume and intensity through the system and you won't necessarily get the same adaptation you would in a calorie surplus because you don't have the the recovery side of it taken mm. care of so what do you do about that well you have to focus more on recovery so that might mean deloads or, or other strategies as well. So absolutely, I think it's, it's, it's an excellent idea to deload during a diet. Um, that's exactly what a diet is. It's a, uh, a lack of recovery um, yeah. and a lack of the, the supportive material you need to make the adaptations. So having deloads, having diet breaks, uh, you know, having refeeds, doing both things on the nutrition and the training side of it to ensure that uh, you don't get burned out and overreached uh, or, or even overtrained, which I have seen with people doing a ton of cardio, being very, very lean, and a ton of um, resistance training, you know, increasing their volume while crash dieting. That can absolutely wreck somebody. You know, the, the few times you see what I would describe as true over, overtraining syndrome in people who are doing resistance training and not endurance training is contest prep bodybuilders and occasionally crossfitters who are taking things too far. Of course, they're doing a lot more than resist resistance training. So, yeah, it's absolutely critical that, that you pay attention to the fatigue management side of it during prep. Definitely. Um, just just a um, question that came in my mind um, out of interest. Um, a lot of people, um, the longer that they diet, they um, have, they um, kind of create, the diet creates some kind of like lack of sleep or just um, lack of sleep quality. Um, what would be your strategies to maximize sleep quality or just in general maybe um, uh, yeah, f fight against that if you can say it like this? Yeah, I mean sleep is, is, is really, really important during prep yeah. and um, the, the strategies are basically the same ones you would probably take in the off season. It's just more important that you actually take them. Mm. So um, we, we reviewed a, an article in, in, in the recent issue of Mass, uh, Greg did specifically, showing that one of the most effective strategies is just getting your head on the pillow earlier. Even if you struggle to fall asleep, um, getting to bed an hour earlier can be very effective uh, with just actually increasing the amount of time spent sleeping and that can have positive effects on performance and recovery. Uh, other things you can do are around uh, what's called sleep hygiene. So for example, um, no screen time 30 minutes prior to, to, getting, to, getting, to getting to bed is important. So have a consistent bedtime, actually set it up as, okay, I'm not going to have any screen time uh, during that period. Um, and doing things to, to ensure that you have a consistent sleep schedule uh, and that your bed is purely there for uh, sleeping and, you know, sex if you're married or have a partner, and that's it. Uh, that you're not spending a lot of time doing other waking or focused activities in bed because it's been shown to also uh, shorten the time it takes to fall asleep. Um, that's basically where I would start. Um, and I think other things that I've found anecdotally to help are that if you do find you wake up in the middle of the night and spend two hours and can't fall back to sleep uh, or wake up early and you're just up, um, that taking naps earlier in the day is okay. I would say try to do it before lunchtime. If you take it too late in the day, then you might find you just have kind of pushes back when you could fall asleep anyway. Uh, especially if you're looking at like, man, I'm only getting four to five hours of sleep. Um, you know, a nap will still not push you, you know, past uh, your normal sleep schedule. I would say if you're already getting a fair amount of sleep and you're like, oh, if I take a nap, will it help me more? Probably not. You're just going to delay the time you fall fall asleep. But if you're in prep and you're chronically underslept, uh, naps can be an excellent tool. Um, also paying attention to caffeine intake. Uh, a lot of preppers will inadvertently increase their caffeine intake so drinking more diet soda uh, or just taking more caffeine because they feel terrible. Um, so I would, I would definitely cap your caffeine intake at around 6 milligrams per kg for the day um, and try not to train late at night and take a large pre-workout. I would say you know, assess your individual tolerance, but most of the time you don't want to take caffeine within like 6 hours of going to bed, um, if not even longer than that, maybe 8 hours depending on 
on the individual. So um, yeah, paying a little more attention to caffeine, getting your head on the pillow earlier, uh, naps if you're underslept, but not if you're you're actually doing okay, and probably before noon, uh, and then consistent bedtime, bed only for sleep, and get your head on the pillow earlier and consistently at the same time, and those can all make a huge difference. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I kind of try to um, prioritize my sleep in the last few weeks even more, and I just have huge um, increases in productivity also, not just like my training went better than ever, but like productivity and what I found in a longer diet that I did was that I just have to pee more in the middle of the night. So I just wake up and have to go to the toilet. Um, that at some point in my gaining phases just doesn't happen anymore. Um, so yeah, maybe um, try to um, decrease your hydration um, throughout the Yeah, not throughout the day, but um, in terms of like when you go to sleep, um, maybe just decrease your water and take a little bit. Could be also a good strategy, I think. Yeah, don't 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 drink a bunch of water before you go to bed. That's definitely a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously you want to stay hydrated, but if yeah. if you, it's not a bad idea, like if you consistently find you wake up in the middle of the night and it disturbs your sleep, you could try having more of it earlier in the day. That's not a bad idea at all. Mm. And I heard people who were really deep in prep um, also in like super crazy shape just getting up like six or seven times in the, in the night and that just sounds so horrible. A lot of the times they are, because they're hungry, they end up drinking more fluids mm. um, and this kind of causes a cascade effect. So you, the more you drink, the more you wash out your sodium, the less water you retain, the more you urinate. Okay. So it's a combination of sodium intake going down and water intake going up. Mm. So it's not staying in the system. So I think some things to try to maintain a consistent sodium intake and to try, it's good to stay hydrated, don't get me wrong, and that can only help during prep, but not to drink so much that it's just way beyond what you need to stay hydrated. Because um, I think what happens is most people, they, they eat their meal, an hour later they're hungry, they're starving, they grab a diet soda. Yeah. And then you kind of repeat that. 10 times. I mean, I've seen people have eight to 10 diet sodas per day during prep. And that's a lot of extra fluids. You know, that's, that's an extra like three to four liters of fluids on top of what they, they might normally drink, which, which obviously is going to make you urinate a ton. Yeah. Um, I kind of tracked my water intake for a week, um, before my photo shoot and I was just drinking like six to seven liters of water a day. It was kind of crazy to uh, actually see because you mostly, I didn't track, track my water before in my whole life and it was kind of crazy to see how much you actually drink. Yeah, and it's, it's, it might be useful for you to check it in the off season just to see what you habitually do when you're not dieting to see if it does change um, or if that's just something you always drink. So yeah, yeah some people, people drink different amounts of water habitually and I think the main thing is if you are finding yourself constantly urinating in the middle of the night, um, just maybe assess like, oh, am I drinking way more water than I need to? Because um, I've actually been in a position where I felt uh, weak, lightheaded, and really low energy. And when I reduced my water intake, I felt better. And I realized, oh, I'm actually washing out a ton of my sodium and actually getting lo low in electrolytes because I'm drinking so much. So, um, mm. something to be aware of. Yeah. Um, cool. I think you covered this pretty well. Um, just because I think we, you're, you're quite good on time, right? Yeah, I'm good to go, man. Okay, cool. Um, maybe we can discuss a more recent article. I think it was in the first um, issue of Mass this year. Um, it was um, how hard do people really train? And it mm -hmm. was um, referencing a study of, I think the name is Barbosa Neto um, mm -hmm. from uh, 2017. And um, I know I have read the article, but just for the audience, um, Who is uh, who's interested? Can you maybe just quickly touch on it and then maybe uh, conclude what you think about the findings and how you would interpret it and yeah, apply it to real life? Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so this is a cool study. Very very straightforward studies too. Basically, they took a bunch of individuals who've been training at least six months in the gym. I believe they were all male, um, and they didn't actually report the final training age. That's so a big caveat to remember as I described the rest of it. All we know is they've been there at least six months. We don't know whether they were on average three years, five years, 
eight months or whatever. I suspect they're a relatively low training age though. And they asked them, hey, how much do you do for 10 reps on bench press in the gym when you train? And they reported that weight. Then they said, okay, now we're going to take that, that weight, put it on the bar, and you can do, do as many reps as you possibly can. Importantly, they did not ask them, what is your 10 rep max? Um, so I think that that's just something to remember as you find out. But then on average, they did 16 reps, plus or minus five, one standard deviation. And when you look at the full spread, um, about... 60% of people did 15 reps or less, and 40% did 16 reps or more. And a solid, I want to say it was around 15%, did way over 20 reps. Now, I think there's nothing wrong with the folks who did 15 reps or less. You know, like for example, uh, I will often do multiple sets at a 6 to 7 RPE, somewhere in there, yeah. uh, which, is, which is fine. That's how you accumulate volume, and you know the RPE is going to climb throughout those sets. Uh, that's a very valid way to train, uh, and always going to failure shouldn't be the goal necessarily. Um, but it's hard to really justify doing 16 reps or more uh, with with the load that you normally do for 10. Uh, I think that that's a combination of two things. One, it's a combination of not actually knowing how far from failure you really are until you're pushed to it, uh, and two, it's a combination of just not being very comfortable with discomfort. And I think um, it, it, it's not normal <laughs> as much as it is, hel it is helpful uh, to be the type of person who likes to go to failure or pushes close to it or who needs a spotter regularly. Mm. Although that is very helpful to ensure you're, you're, you're training hard enough and heavy enough to induce an adaptation. Uh, but when you look at most people in the gym, most people are not going to failure. There's a, there's a small select group of people who are, who are pushing those reps until they start to grind. And they're typically the people who actually have some muscular development you know, we're moving, moving decent loads. And that should tell you something, you know. So I think um, there's a couple of confounding factors, but the overall message is still the same in that um, a fair amount of people are well short of failure in their training regularly. Um, they're not often, you know, bodybuilders or experienced lifters. In fact, there was another study that I believe uh, Fisher and Steele did um, where they asked people of various training ages um, to – guess based on their training log what load did they were they, were their like were their 10 rep max essentially mm -hmm. or how many reps they could do to failure and then they would have them test it and the novices were about three to four reps off uh, and then they had like five different cl classifications of lifter but the the most the like the experts uh, they were four years in the gym or more and they were within half a rep most of the time and only on i think like leg press they were two reps away so they were within zero to two rir in most lifts so I think what this tells you is that once someone is relatively experienced in the gym, has gone through a lot of training cycles, spent some time training to failure, this is probably a non-issue. But for the early stage intermediates and the novices, uh, it is very easy to be um, to not know how close to failure you are, and that accounts for maybe three reps or so on average. Uh, but there are, like I said, there are some people who are hitting 20 reps with their 10 rep max. So I think. Um, the solution is that when you're a novice and when you're an intermediate, probably more when you're an intermediate, because so you're actually going to take a little more to, to stimulate growth and, and strength, is take a cycle of low volume, low frequency training with a spotter and actually push to failure on, on a lot of your, at least your, like your last set for each movement. Mm. Um, even though that may not be optimal, I think it will be really useful investment for the rest of your training career so that you know what it feels like to push until you're actually close to failure. And that'll improve your ability earlier to assess your actual true intensity in terms of repetitions in reserve. Um, really interesting, um, especially the practical application that you should do a short cycle of just failure training, basically. Um, what I found with clients that the more, as you said, the, the more experienced somebody somebody is, that they that they can just um, yet. Um, more objectively um, gauge their RPE or reps in reserve and the more novice somebody is that they actually cannot do it but they will learn it pretty fast if they at, at least Absolutely. if they at some point come closer to failure and yeah and yeah it's, it's one of those things where I think novices pick it up pretty quick and in my experience yeah. um, someone who's getting serious about weight training and they're not, they're not just doing it because uh, you know, my doctor said I'm, I should get in shape or, 
or you know my, my coach is making me do this but I really just want to play baseball or whatever but if someone is like right I want to be a weightlifter or I want to be a bodybuilder or etc um, within maybe three months um, they're way more accurate not as accurate as they will be in four years yeah. uh, at gauging repetitions in reserve for sure um, I probably wouldn't use it as the <clears throat> primary loading um, tool but I would probably have them tracking it so they get good at it and like like you said, there would be some sets taken to failure here and there so they can gain that skill. But maybe once they've been in the gym over a year, then we could actually start using RPE as a, as a, as a guideline. And I think um, a lot of the critique of RPE or using RIR has been based on studies that, of people who have been training you know, less than a year. And uh, it's probably not a great tool for complete novices uh, unless they've been familiarized with it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, what I I have seen some people, um, yeah, kind of referencing this study to, um, yeah, trying to tell people that they should train harder. But um, at least in my observation, at least in my basic um, gym here in Germany, it's definitely not the case. Like people are hitting failure basically on every set and pretty much doing like um, eccentric eccentric actions or uh, like spotting um, and yeah um, I think it's also um, in this study they uh, shouted at the um, at the at the uh, province is that, is that you yeah that's them? that's another huge yeah. confounder is that the way we push someone to failure uh, in studies is with verbal motiv motivation so you'll have yeah. two spotters maybe three spotters uh, and one other person collecting data so at least three people if not more Uh, all verbally encouraging you loudly, uh, often while music plays. It's like all these things are known to enhance performance. So we're trying to get a maximum response. That, that's that's yeah. often how we will standardize. So everyone gets the most motivation possible. Uh, so that it's the same each time. Uh, I don't think they said they, they played music in this one. I didn't see that, but they often don't report that. So you okay. very well could have been listening to heavy metal and having four people yell at you uh, and pushing you way to the point of failure where maybe you thought you had failure a rep or two reps earlier. So if they had gone to the gym on their own and got a spotter and gone to failure, it might have not been 16 plus or minus 5, it might have been 14 or 15. So even that's part of it. So the, the enhanced stimulation, um, the, the fact that uh, they, they may have been purposely training submaximally in training, I think it does exaggerate the differences. Okay. Um, but then at a certain point you have to be like, well, man, like 40% of people mm -hmm. are doing a lot of reps. Even if we just take the people over... We're hitting like 18 reps or more. It's like, man, two out of 10 people are training way too light. Um, so, yeah, and, and like your individual observation that you mentioned in your gym, that's not the case. It totally depends on where you're training. Like yeah. um, the gyms that, that I, I train at here in, in Auckland, um, you know, I'll, I'll go to uh, Get Strength, which is a powerlifting gym. Or I will be at North Sport Olympic Weightlifting, which is an Olympic weightlifting gym. So it's not even really relevant, you know, like. No one does snatches to failure in an Olympic weightlifting gym. That's a CrossFit thing, you know. Um, but when they're doing accessory work or squats, yeah, people need spotters all the time. Mm. Um, and uh, likewise, and get strength, people are training hard. But now, if I was to, when I go to the commercial gym, uh, to where I do some of my bodybuilding work, all over the place, there's people who are, yeah. you know, like on their phone while doing like a, a one arm movement because that's how little, little effort it takes. Uh, or, or using form that is not even possible with an adequate load because they're not even in the line of polar gravity anymore. Uh, doing weird things with a lap pull down that, that you didn't think that was possible. So I think it's more of an issue in commercial gyms uh, and people who are casually in there, probably won't be next week, uh, than it is in necessarily um, you know, serious weightlifters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I train at a commercial gym, but like mostly in the free weight area and like the people that train there are probably pretty serious, at least right now, maybe not next right. week, but right now they are. For now they're serious, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I really found it interesting that you mentioned the kind of like real life versus uh, lab intensity in terms of music and just shouting at the people. I, yeah, I, I could imagine that this will motivate you at some point to just push out more reps um, and actually just training over the, the pain. <laughs> um, Absolutely. 
do you know if the people in this study actually um, have some kind of stop where just like technique broke down? Yeah, so how they, how they dictate failure in studies is normally based on movement standards. Uh, okay. So, for example, uh, if, if a squat doesn't reach a certain depth, uh, then, then that doesn't count. Uh, and if you consistently don't hit depth, then we cut the set off. Um, on bench press, if you don't touch your chest, or if you bounce it, uh, or if your butt comes off the bench, those are, those are typically, in a, in a lab that's doing it correctly, uh, indicators that, okay, that doesn't count. Um, so in a multiple rep set, you definitely you enforce the person, hey, here are the movement standards. It has to stay within these guidelines. Keep going. You have spotters. Don't worry. Don't alter your form. Uh, if, if you get stuck, we won't let you get hurt. Um, so, and then I'd say like 90% of the time, that's what happens. They just try to push and they can't go further. 10% of the time, uh, they'll freak out or, or just lose, lose technique as they get closer and you'll see their butt come up or the, the bar bounce. And then you just don't count that rep and it might slightly, um, under report what their true max would have been if they'd maintained form. Uh, but I think it all shakes out in the end when you're reporting averages. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I think most people should probably work with the technical failure instead of just like concentric, oh, absolutely. concentric yeah. failure. So in the real world, yeah, yeah I, I think uh, 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 if you can't maintain form, you're no longer doing the exercise, right? Yeah. So failure is defined by the point at which uh, you, you reach technical failure. Now the good news is that, uh, and that's another way to know how experienced of a lifter you are. Um, for me, on most of my lifts, technical failure and true failure are the same point mm. um, because I've been lifting for 14 years. When I've been lifting for a year and a half, that wasn't always the case on certain movements, you know. Uh, so if you're at the point where you could alter your form and get more reps and alter your form negatively, you know, uh, then you are still relatively new to the gym and still learning how to lift and learning how to lift at a high intensity and near to failure. Uh, so you shouldn't be pushing there. You don't want to ingrain bad technique uh, and increase your risk of injury. I would definitely use technical failure and just know that those two points will become closer uh, over time as you know a squat like if you watch a very high level power lifter their third attempt on squat whether they make it or, or miss it it looks the same until they miss mm. and then they start to go the wrong direction you know uh, unless they get out of position so unless they actually make a technical error a missed squat looks the same until you hit failure as, as a made squat it's just slower you know I think uh, filming is like really really um, a good tool to just um gauge your technique and then also um what your what your rpe maybe is in real life if, if you uh, watch the bar speed and stuff absolutely yeah that's one thing I, i recommend to a lot of lifters um sometimes how it feels might just be a little harder than yeah. it actually looked to the to the coach so i think i personally like um looking at video afterwards Uh, anytime I'm not too sure. Sometimes I just I have a very strong feeling about the RPE based on how it felt. Mm. I felt like I was in tune with it, and I don't feel like I need to look at a video. Um, okay. But for people who are newer to RPE or who tend to habitually under-report their RPE, I think looking at, at a video is pretty important. So if you then watch the video, do you change your mind about the RPE that you uh, maybe thought it, were, it would be before you watch the video, or do you just combine both the feeling and the video like the bar speed? Yeah, I typically, I, 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 depending on the, so some people who like, so because I'm an online coach, the only time I see people lift is through video. Yeah. So they, they've seen it and I've seen it. Um, and what they say the RPE is, and, and what the video says, if there's a discrepancy, that's all I'm basing it on. So then I, I ask them, hey, wait, don't rate the RPE until you look at the video if there's a large discrepancy. Um, because they need something a little more objective to go on. Uh, personally, I will normally look at video, I'll record video for technical purposes, um, and then I will often just ask my wife, hey, what do you think for the RPE? Because she's my, my training partner. Cool. Um, but if I don't have my wife with me on a training on my own, um, I will look at the video for not only technical purposes, but also to confirm uh, how was I on my RPE. And then I will sometimes modify my score if... Uh, if I think I was way overzealous or, or underzealous. But most of the time I'm pretty on point. Like I'm, I'd say, 
I maybe about half an RPE point off most of the time. I rarely accidentally hit failure in training. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think, you know, being fo hyper-focused on RPE as part of my PhD and then lifting for 14 yeah. years and being in, in powerlifting and bodybuilding, so getting the opportunity to train heavy and near to failure on the big three plus accessory movements, I think has been a useful tool for me to get a pretty good gauge of that. Interesting. Um, yeah, more people should film their training. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Eric, um, it's been almost an hour and um, I think we touched on some interesting topics and um, I will probably conclude it now. Um, where can people find your uh, work and also your personal stuff? Absolutely. And just thanks for having me. It's been a good discussion. Um, well, yeah. You. So probably the absolutely. The best place to go, I would say, is 3dmusclejourney.com. From there, you can kind of find links to all the other stuff that kind of came up casually in this conversation. Um, for example, Mass, our monthly research review, you can find a link there if you want to subscribe and see what myself, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Greg Knuckles have reviewed each month that's relevant to bodybuilding and powerlifting uh, and strength sport in general. Thank you. Uh, if you're interested in my books, there's also links there to Muscle and Strength Pyramids, which kind of outline... Uh, my thoughts on, on training and nutrition and their priorities. Uh, you can also get a, get a link to our podcast for 3DMJ, our YouTube videos, also the 3DMJ Vault, which is kind of like our uh, little online courses for, for bodybuilders and powerlifters who want to become students of the sport. Uh, our coaching is there. And then the only thing that you can't find a link there, uh, of course, would be the SBS Academy, which is starting soon, which is uh, shreddedbyscience.com. Um, and finally, uh, my Instagram, which is at Helms 3 dmj Cool. Um, yeah, we should definitely plug the SBS Academy for a short time. Like it's, it's just been from, from myself. It just was like, I started it back in the days and I wasn't even like, uh, sure that I want to be a trainer and it just like hugely changed my life to like. It sounds kind of cheesy, but it's just like that for real. Well, it's got a great community behind it. You know, I Definitely. was both myself and, and Mike Zerdos, who, for those yeah. li listening who don't know, I teach the coaching bodybuilders unit and Mike teaches the coaching powerlifters unit. We've been, it's been really cool to get to teach that, uh, but more so the community uh, that uh, Luke and Lawrence and uh, the SPS Academy as a whole has generated and created has been outstanding and um, every time I get the opportunity to go to the UK and meet up with everybody it's it's always such a cool cool group so yeah I, I, I don't think that's overstating anything at all I think a lot of people share that same sentiment is there anything planned that is not out there yet that you can talk about in terms of uh, um, I know that Luke uh, wrote something in the um, in the SPS team group that uh, I think some um, um, presentations are coming But I'm not quite sure when exactly. He didn't mention it yet. You know, I think Luke's the mastermind there. I, I, uh, I don't, I don't know anything yet that that is on on deck that's coming. Um, okay. Yeah, at least not for the SBS Academy. I mean, I've got second edition of the Muscle and Strength Pyramids are on the way this year, and some other work through 3DMJ. But I know Luke, Luke, Luke's always got some up his sleeve, so I'm sure he's got cool stuff planned for 2018 as well. Actually, I wanted to ask you about um, the Muscle and Strength Pyramid 2.0 as well. Hmm. What about it? Yeah, just <laughs> have you anything um, safe yet or do you just um, still work on it? Yeah, definitely just still plugging away, making edits. Um, I'm excited about the changes to the, uh, the training plans in the, the training book. Uh, previously, I was using the 2007... Uh, Wernbaum systematic review that kind of gave guidelines for frequency, intensity, and volume, and those are all based on total number of reps, yeah. uh, which which makes programming a little more difficult if you were trying to do it on your own. And the recent uh, Schoenfeld meta analysis that came out, I think last year, uh, in full press uh, of 10 plus sets per per muscle group, and then the, the similar one that was done by Ralston for strength allows me to operate with just number of hard sets in a certain intensity zone. So I think that'll, I, I will have an easier guide for, hey, if you want to write your own program based on the principles, here's how you do it. I think with the, the guidelines for total number of reps per body part, 
Um, some people got a little bogged down, and that may might have been a barrier to them, you know, writing their own training. And I think uh, I think that hopefully will will I'll be able to write a, a more succinct guide on here. Here's step one, two, three, four, five. Write your own training program. So I'm excited about that. Uh, super cool. I didn't know that actually. Um, do you still personally work with reps? Or? Uh, I look at it. I look at it in terms of sets, uh, and then the various zones that they're in. You know, so obviously, okay. for a, a bodybuilder, um, not obviously, people might not know this, but um, for the most part, if you were to match number of sets in, like, say, the six RM or lighter zone, so anywhere from six RM to twenty yeah. RM, you're probably going to get a similar effect for hypertrophy. Strength, not so much. Obviously, a six RM set is going to yeah. build more strength because it's more similar to a one RM yeah. than a twenty RM. Um, however, when you try to match, like say, a, a two to four RM to a ten RM, uh, you're going to see more hypertrophy from the same number of sets of ten RM, just because there's not enough total, uh, I would call it impulse, uh, which is time and force uh, produced in, in a two to four RM set. That the force is obviously there, but there's not enough time spent producing it mm. to get the same uh, magnitude of effect in terms of hypertrophy. So. It evens out at a certain point, but not, I would say, probably safely under 6RM. You know, like if you do a set of 6 to failure, it's going to be a little slower from the, from the get-go. The amount of time spent that it'll take to complete those 6 reps is more than it would take to complete the first 6 reps of, say, a 15RM, because those are going to move quicker. Uh, and then the force generated is going to be higher the whole time for a 6RM set compared to that 15RM. But because that 15RM set then extends for another 9 reps, you're going to get a similar total amount of kind of fiber stimulation, especially when you hit that failure point. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's easy. I think it's easy and it's it's useful um, from a hyper, hyper from a hypertrophy perspective to just count number of hard sets within a given zone. Um, if you were to look at six RM and lower and the effect, you'd probably need to look at total reps. Mm. But I think as, as a heuristic kind of easy to use rule, um, you can probably just take a look at number of hard sets for hypertrophy. Interesting, because um, I changed from reps to sets as well at some point. Mm -hmm. I didn't know mm -hmm. that you actually do it as well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it, I haven't I won't, I won't officially be doing it in, in terms of people's minds until they see the book. But yeah, that's yeah. definitely something that I when, I, when I program, I, I think about it from that perspective. Interesting. Uh, so I just accidentally expanded the podcast for like, I don't know, eight minutes longer or so. I was actually nothing wrong with that. Going to conclude, yeah, it was some good insight, was some good information. Um, so Eric, um, it's been an honor to have you on here, and I want to uh, say thank you again. And yeah, shit, my pleasure. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you for having me on.